We're going to be in Deuteronomy. That's Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, fifth book in the Old Testament, chapter 30, 34. Come on, do you love Jesus this morning? Huh? Amen. And this is what it says. It says, Then Moses went up from the plains of Moab to Mount Nebo, to the top of Pisgah, which is opposite of Jericho. And the Lord showed him all the land, Gilead as far as Dan, all Naphtali, the land of Ephraim and Manasseh, and the land of Judah, as far as the western sea, the Negev, and the plain that is the valley of Jericho, the city of palm trees, as far as Zoar. And the Lord said to him, This is the land of which I have swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, and I will give it to their offspring. I have let you see it with your eyes, but you shall not go over in it. Jump to verse 9, and it says this, And Joshua, the son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom, for Moses had laid his hands on him. So the people of Israel obeyed him and did as the Lord had commanded Moses. And there has not arisen a prophet since like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face, none like him for all the signs and the wonders that the Lord sent, sent him to Egypt to do to Pharaoh and to all of his servants and to all the land. And for all the mighty power and all the great deeds that Moses did in the sight of Israel. Father, we thank you for your word. I pray today, Lord, that we would have the spirit of wisdom and revelation that would come upon us right now so that we could know you better, Jesus. This whole life is about knowing you, being with you, seeing you. And I pray that would take place in each and every one of our lives here this morning. Father, I pray that I would decrease so that your spirit would increase so that this word you've given would go forth sharper than any two-edged sword, dividing our bone from marrow and spirit from soul, cutting off anything that is not of you, leaving only you in our lives. We pray that right now. And we believe, we believe it in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen, amen. Before you're seated, Hug three people, high five three people. Tell them this, say, say, get off the edge, get off the edge. So that's six people, get off the edge. Come on. <clears throat> What's up, CWC? How y'all doing today? Are you good? Amen. Well, I know I'm good because it's so good to see all of you. You know, something I was thinking about and talking to my wife about is how we never want to take for granted all of you who choose to be here with us. Come on, we never want to take for granted all of you who support CWC monetarily and prayerfully. Man, it's, it's, it's such a blessing, and we never want to take that, that for granted, being the pastors of such a great church. Now, I don't know if you realize this, but the reason the church is great is because we serve a God who is so great, who, do, who does miracles so great. Amen. <clears throat> and because a bunch of great people are here. Amen. Amen. No, but I say all that to just say, Good morning. How are you? I always say this, pastors, listen, when you tell them to say hello, it takes them five minutes to say hello, and then another five minutes to say goodbye. And so what do you do in between there? But no, so <clears throat> I am so excited. I do have to admit, all right, so I've been dealing with a lot of vertigo lately, right? So everything is, is a little off kilter on me. And so can I have grace from you this morning? Amen because we serve a God. I believe God has a word. I wasn't going to preach. And then I was like, wait a minute, man. God, God got a, he's got a word. And so I'm going to push through this thing with the help of you. All right. So you're going to help your pastor today. Yeah. Amen. Amen. So look, guys, we're going to wrap up this, this scene that we are currently in that we've titled exile to Exodus, exile to Exodus with a message titled on the edge. Come on, touch your neighbor, say, say, get off the edge. Tell him, say, get off the edge, get off the edge, get off the edge. <laughs> and so look, as I was preparing for this message, right, I started to, to wonder about how many times have we been on the edge of a promise? 
How many times we've been on the edge of a promise, but because we didn't persevere in obedience, we, we missed out on that promise. How many times have we been on the edge of a breakthrough, but because we, we lacked faith in obedience, we, we missed the breakthrough that God desired to bring our way. And so I was wondering, wondering about that when I was preparing for this message. See, scripture says this, not to grow weary in doing good, because in due season, in due time, at the right time, you will reap a harvest in God's time. How many know God's timing is perfect? Amen, it's perfect. Scripture also says this, says, blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, come on, touch your neighbor, say, keep standing. Tell him, say, keep standing, keep standing. When he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life which God has promised to those who love him. Yeah. Amen. 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 Our perseverance for God speaks and declares our relationship with him, our obedience to him, our love towards him. There's, there is so much more to this thing than, than just some good lip service, than just talking a big, big game. And, and look, our standing during testing takes real concrete faith. It, it takes real faith. It, it takes the evidence of things hoped for, the substance of things not yet seen. When you have substance and you have evidence, you have something tangible and real. It's not just talk. It's not just talk, it's more than, than lip service. And, and if we wanna be a people who remain standing in the face of trials, if we wanna be a people who, who pass the tests that come our way, then we have to have a real relationship with a real Jesus. Yeah. Amen. Amen. See, our lives, the way we walk, the way we talk, the way we live, the way we move, the way that we have our being needs to sing a song declaring that Jesus is king over our lives. It's a necessity, it's a, it's a must. We, we have to live a real relationship with a real Jesus. If we desire to, to stand during trials, to receive the crown of life that is, is promised to those who, who love him. You wanna receive the crown of life? I know I do. And we gotta remain standing. And Jesus has to become real in our lives. And, and you know the way that he becomes real is that when we seek him with all that is within us, that's how he becomes real, when we stay in his word and we remain on our knees and we lift up our hands in worship to the king. This is how Jesus becomes real to us. And, and if we wanna be a people who remain standing, touch your neighbor, say, keep standing. I'm, I'm gonna do this a lot. Touch your neighbor for the third time of 56 times of touching your neighbor. So if we wanna keep standing, we have to know Jesus and have a real relationship with Jesus, fully trusting who Jesus is. So I had this dear friend of mine, he, he said to me, I was going through some, some tough stuff in my life and, and he said to me, he said, Keith, if you wanna get past the test, you have to get past the test. So in other words, if you wanna P-A-S-S -S the test in order to get P-A-S-T the test, you gotta remain standing in the midst of the test. But God doesn't let us move on to another test until we pass the test we are currently facing. Does that make sense? Yeah. He doesn't let us move on until we've passed the current test that we are in. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he had stood the test, when he stood the test, how many of you know that sometimes standing is passing? Yes. No, for real. There's times in my life where just me standing is me passing. Blessed are they that, that under, under trials, they, they remain standing and they'll receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who, who love him. And so I was wondering, right, how many times have we been on the edge of a promise, but because we did grow weary in doing good, we didn't reap the harvest. We we didn't reap the promise that God so eagerly desires to, to give us be, because we didn't remain standing. And so look, as I'm thinking about that and all that is flooding my mind, this, this thought as I'm preparing this message, I, I started to think about this too though. It's really not good to constantly 
be remaining thinking about the promises we may have missed. Because if we do that too long, if we do that too long, it'll mess us up. It'll mess us up. That's why Paul encourages us with this. He says, forget what lies behind you. Instead, press forward to the high call that you have in Christ heavenward. Right? Which is so good because we can't allow our past mistakes to keep us from our future blessing. It's so true. We, we can't allow our past failures to keep us from our current and future harvests. God has a harvest for your life. Amen. And so we can't remain just, just constantly thinking and regretting all the things we may have missed along the way. We can't do that. However, there is a balance in this thing because Jesus says this, blessed are they that mourn for they shall be comforted. And what Jesus is saying here, he's not speaking to a type of mourning that takes place when we've lost someone or something. Although that's, that's true as well. God does turn our mourning into dancing. Amen. He does. And so he'll bring great comfort during those seasons of mourning when we've experienced loss in our lives. But this is the Beatitudes. This is Jesus teaching us what it is, how we are to be, how our attitudes should be living for him. And he says, blessed are they that mourn, who understand that they've not stood during the testing. They haven't remained faithful during the the trials, and now they are reflecting on all their failings and they are mourning over their failing. They're mourning because they were sinning against me. Those people, I will comfort them. Matter of fact, he says this too. He says, blessed are the poor in spirit for they shall see God. Again, they're broken and they're humbled by the testing that they were just facing. And now they are standing before God, before Jesus saying, Lord, forgive me. I don't wanna live that way. I wanna live the way that you've called me to live. Amen, so there's this, there is this, this balance. See, what happens when we, when we do that, when we mourn over the things that we've, we've done and how we've wronged God, it creates a space and a place for the Holy Spirit to elevate you and comfort you. Instead of just blowing past our, our failures and, and our sins, like, ah, it don't really matter. I'm under grace, we'll just move on to the next, we'll just move on to the next thing. It's a dangerous place. Because see, the day and age that you and I live in, they're constantly telling us, right? Get whatever you can get, live your best life now. Whatever feels good to you now, do that thing. And it doesn't matter who you step on, step through, go around to get what you wanna get, j- just do that. And Jesus says this, he says, no, no, no. Don't do what the world says to do because that is the testing that I'm allowing to come in your life. And if you remain steadfast, if you persevere in obedience by faith, you'll receive the crown of life. You'll you'll receive the promise of of eternity in your life. How many times, I wonder, have we been on the edge of the promise, but because we didn't continue to stand, We didn't continue to walk in obedience. We we missed out on those promises. And as I was thinking about this, reflecting on this, the Lord took me back to to an encounter I had several, several years ago with with another person. This person was in ministry with me, right? And God was doing amazing things with this guy. Amazing things. Don't look around because it wasn't here. Amen. Like (laughs) They're not here. I'm not talking about here. But God was doing amazing things through him. People were being touched by God through this young man. But because that started to happen, because he started to experience some success, he started to think more highly of himself than he ought to think. He began to think, well, it's because of me that God is using me. It's because of of me, right? right? I'm the reason God is, is moving. Instead of acknowledging, no, no, it's because of who God is, not of who we are, that God moves. Which, by the way, let me just caveat that with this. It's really easy to fall into that type of mindset, by the way. Super easy. You know why? Because our our flesh is so weak and it loves the praise of men. 
And so when people are telling you how good you're doing and how great things are going, right, you start believing this lie that the flesh is trying to put in your mind and in your heart that it's because of who you are God is moving instead of because of who he is. As a matter of fact, I'll share a story with you. Okay, I'm going to be really transparent. You guys cool with the story? Yeah. We got a bunch of stories today. Amen. Because like, it highlights what I'm talking about. And I remember when this happened to me. It was very early on in my ministry. But very early on. I'd only been saved for like a year, right? God delivers me from addiction. Boom, starts to, to put me in front of people to share my testimony that he's given me. And there were a ton of people getting saved and set free by the power of God, him working through me, right? And so I see this and I start thinking, I'm pretty hot stuff. Like, you know what I mean? Like, you know what I mean? Puff my chest out a little bit because, you know, I'm doing good. You know what I mean? Like, and, and I'll never forget how the Lord corrected me in that season. One day I was spending time with him and it was at the very end of my time with him. I'd spent like 12 hours with him, up all night with him. And at the very end, he takes me, and I'm getting ready to close off my prayer time because I had to go to work. And right at the very end, the Lord says, no, no, flip to Philippians, to the end of Philippians. I said, okay, God, cool. Well, well, in this, what is happening is the apostle Paul is writing to the church of Philippi. And he's saying to them, listen, I'm not going to be able to go myself. I'm not gonna be able to come because I'm imprisoned. (laughs) So I'm gonna send to you Epaphroditus. And he says this, the reports are true that you heard that he was sick, even sick unto death. But I prayed for him and God healed him, not only for him, but also for me so that I wouldn't have sorrow upon sorrow. And as I'm reading that, the the Holy Spirit spoke so clearly to me and so firmly. He said, the reason I saved you was because your mom prayed for you so that she wouldn't have sorrow upon sorrow. This is what the Holy Spirit, I mean, crush me. And I was like, oh my gosh. God set me in my place early on, which can I say that was the grace of God disciplining me to make sure that I remained humble before him. Because listen, we, we have to remain humble because God, he exalts the humble, but he opposes the proud. And so in this moment, God was, was saying to me, listen, this isn't because of you. It's because of me in you. Don't ever forget it. Like, <laughs> And I was like, cool, cool. So now when when my flesh tries to do that to me, I can easily point back to the evidence of a word that God had spoken over me so that the flesh has no reign or hold on me. Amen. Amen. But we gotta remain remain humble. But but it's real easy to fall into this thing, thinking that it's because of of us that God is is moving amongst us. And this is what this young man was was doing. This is what he started to believe. Man, I warned him, I prayed with him, I shared with him that story I just shared with you. But man, he, he, didn't, want to, he didn't want to hear it at all, man. He was, he was feeling it. And because he didn't humble himself, it wasn't long after that that he left because he felt he was owed more than what he was receiving. Because that's what happens when we start focusing on ourselves, we start to think we are owed more than what we actually have because it's about us. And so this is what, what happened. He's thinking of himself more highly than he ought to think. And so he thinks he's owed more than he he actually got. And so he leaves. And what's wild is is something that, that he didn't know that I knew was he was on the edge of a promise that God was about to deliver. But because he grew impatient, because he grew frustrated, he missed out on that promise in that season of his life. And, and the real travesty of it is he's still on the edge of the promise because he's still fighting and battling that same testing. God don't let us get past the test until we have passed the test. And so here he is, he's he's dealing with that. I wonder how many of us have been on the edge of a promise, but because of our impatience and because of our frustrations and because we've got busy looking at ourselves, we, we never got to walk in to the promise. We remained on the edge of it. Touch your neighbor again and say, get off the edge. Tell him, say, get off the edge. Get off the edge. And this scene here with with Moses is quite the scene. I mean, if you think back over Moses' life, it is incredible what God used Moses to do. The things he did for him and through him. 
Matter of fact, we see it right at the beginning of his life. As soon as he's born, God saves him. Because what had happened was this Pharaoh had issued a decree over the land to kill all the, the Hebrew boys under the age of two. Kill them all. But see, God had a plan for Moses, so he protected Moses and guarded Moses. And how he protected him was by putting him in Pharaoh's own house. Think, think about that for, for just a second, because this is, this is wild to me. Not only did God spare Moses from Pharaoh, but then he also had Pharaoh take care of Moses. It's so wild. And this is what God does, right? God sees how the enemy is trying to, to kill Moses, to take Moses out. And so God uses Moses to set a whole lot of other people free. Amen. And th this, is what he, this is what he does. And it's a familiar thing that God does throughout scripture and throughout our lives if we pay attention. Think about the story of Jesus, same exact thing. There was a decree in the land to kill all the babies under two. Same exact scenario, right? It's a representation, it's a foreshadowing of what was gonna come with Jesus. Same exact thing. And God used the one that the enemy tried to kill to give life to the many. This is what, this is what God does. He, he will always use the enemy schemes against the enemy. And I'll tell you, this, this past week, I had a, a guy reach out to me. And him and I, when we were young, right? Which I'm still young, by the way. Amen. But when I was younger, like, when I was younger, him and I used to party together. We would run around together. We, we did all kinds of things together. And this is what he spoke to me. He said, hey, Pastor Keith, he said, I want you to know this. Because of what God has done for you, I believe that he could do it for me. He said, and I, amen, yeah. He said, and I believed. And, and he said it like this, actually. I figured if he could do it for Keith Deal, why not? He, might, he better be able to do it for me. I was like, <laughs> like fall back. <laughs> but this is, this is what he said. And it's wild what God has done in this young man's life. He is saved, set free, filled by the Holy Ghost. He's got his family back. All four of his boys, him and his wife, are hungry for Jesus, passionate for Jesus. And here he is. He's in full-time ministry, in school right now to get his credentials to be a pastor. He's preaching his first message ever next Sunday, calls me and says, hey, pastor, can you help me with this? And I'm like, you better believe I can help you. <laughs> Amen. This is what God does. This is just what he does. And the reason he does it is because he's the one getting the glory from it. Amen. Amen. I always say this, God can use me. You know why? Because I know that it's all him and not me. It's real easy for me to, to see that. And so look, if you're here today and you're struggling through something, be of good courage because you serve a God who is faithful. You serve a God that will take what the enemy means for harm and use it for you, your, your good. So just keep standing, keep persevering, because God is getting ready to start using the things you've been through to bring others through what they're going through. Amen. Amen. Because <clears throat> nothing we go through is ever in vain. Never. That's why scripture says that, that the canker worm is going to have to pay back a hundredfold what he stole from us. Whatever the enemy has taken, he's got to pay us back a hundredfold. Come on. Come on. This is what God does. Tries it with Moses here in this, in this scene. Tries to, tries to kill him before he, even, before he even grows up. Which, by the way, he should have killed him when he had the chance. He should have. It's funny. Pastor Jim, every single Sunday, you know, he texts me. Dear friend of mine, he texts me every Sunday. He should have killed you when he had the chance. <laughs> now go get him. I'm like, let's go. Like, pumps me up a little bit. No, but the enemy tried to take Moses out, but because God had a plan for Moses, he protected Moses and put him in Pharaoh's house, okay? But then you fast forward a few years and Moses now is a, is a man and he starts to become angry because he starts thinking that the promise is depending on him. And so he becomes angry because he's seeing how the Egyptians are mistreating all the Israelites. One day he's out walking around the city and he runs across this Egyptian beaten on this Israelite. And so he takes matters into his own hands and he kills the Egyptian. 
And this was not God's plan for his life. This wasn't God's plan. You know how I know that? Because it caused him to run away from the promise. Moses had to go on the run from the promise because he took it into his own hands. See, Moses' promise was to help free the people of Israel from bondage, not flee from the people of Israel, leaving them in bondage. And so this is, this is what happens here in this story because he takes it into his own hands. He, he has to now run and he's, he's on, the, on the run. But, but while he's on the run, he ends up finding a wife. Come on, how many of you know, even on a run and when we're running from God, God will still bring good things in our lives because he's a good God? Just because he's a good God and, and he loves giving good gifts to his children. He, he just does. And so here Moses is, he's on the run but God still sends good for him and he gets a wife and he has some kids and now he's the shepherd over his father-in-law's flock. And he's thinking that all this Egyptian stuff is behind him. It's been several years. And he thinks, oh, that's behind me. I got a family now. This is, this is the new direction. This is the new promise, right? And, and he thinks he's, he's done with the, the stuff from Egypt. But then God shows up in the form of a burning bush. And this is wild, because I love this so much. And he reminds Moses of who he is, not what Moses has done. That's incredible. That's incredible. How many of you understand this? That when Jesus comes after us, he doesn't remind us of what we've done, he only reminds us of who he is. He reminds you. He reminds you not of what you've done, but of who he is. He reminds you that he has good plans for your life. He'll remind you, right, that you are the head and not the tail. He, he will remind you that you are blessed in your coming and blessed in your going. He will remind you that you are more than a conqueror through him who, who strengthens you. This is what God does. It's amazing that when he comes running for us and when he finds us, he doesn't remind us of what we've done. He only talks about of who he is. This is what happens in the life of Moses. God comes to him. He finds him on the run. And he begins to speak over Moses, telling him how he is with him and how he has good friends. And something that's really good that you don't want to miss here, this, this is so good. Because even though Moses was on the run from the promise, the promise never left him. The promise came for him. It's so good. It's so good. It never left him. Instead, it followed him and pursued him. And I've seen this in my life so many different occasions where I've tried to run from the promise. And Jesus didn't let me outrun the promise. The, the promise tracked me down. You know why? Because there's no shadow he won't light up. No mountain he won't climb up. Come in after you. There's no wall he won't kick down, no lie, he won't tear down, coming after you. And so even though we, we try to run from his promise, the promise never, never leaves us. It'll come and, and find us. It'll, it'll follow us to the ends of the earth. And so look, let me encourage you that maybe you feel like you're in a season of your life where you know you've ran from the promise, where you're on the run from the promise. Well, we'll know this, that God's promises hasn't left you and they're always accessible to you if you simply turn to him. That's it. That, that's our job in this equation, turning to him and trusting him, persevering in who he is. And so we, we see this in, in this story, in this scene of the burning bush, right? The promise comes after Moses. When it finds Moses, it reminds Moses. He reminds Moses, I am with you, and I'm gonna use you. Just be obedient and just have faith in me. And God tells, tells Moses, now go and, and tell, because I want you to think about this. So here he is, he's on the run. He's on the run from his promise. He's on the run from Egypt. And the moment God shows up to him, God tells him to go back to Egypt. Go back to Egypt and go tell this, this Pharaoh who's trying to kill you that if he don't let my people go, there's gonna be repercussions. 
I want you to tell him, him that. And I'm telling you, this, this took really, really great faith, by the way. Super great faith to return to the place you're running from because God has a plan for you in that place. It takes great faith. And Moses, he does it. He does it. He returns like God tells him to return and he tells Pharaoh to let his people go. Now, when he arrives at Egypt, when he goes into Egypt, we've already seen, S-E-E-N, what he has done. How God did all these amazing things in this particular scene, S-C-E-N-E. I don't know why I'm spelling it for you, but the scene of the story. We, we, we seen how God, we saw how God used him in these mighty, amazing ways. How, how God turned his staff into a serpent. How God, through Moses, turned the water into blood. How he covered the whole land with frogs, flies, and gnats. How he killed all the livestock. How he, he destroyed all the vegetation through a hailstorm, a swarm of locusts, and, and extreme darkness. We've seen how God brought all these boils on all of their enemies. We've seen how God killed every, every single child that the Egyptians had, from man to beast. Moses watched as God did all of this. He watched as God did all these amazing things through him and for him. And God doesn't stop there, right? If we remember the story well, we talked about it a little bit last week. God led them by a pillar of cloud by day, a pillar of fire by night. Moses watched as God fed him and everyone else with supernatural bread from heaven. He, he's watching this. He's seeing this. He's the one performing it from God to the people. He watched as God provided water from a rock at Horeb. God told Moses, strike the rock. And upon striking the rock, the water will flow and all the people will be satisfied by me. Doesn't stop there. God then takes Moses up onto Mount Sinai. And it's on Mount Sinai that he, he meets with Moses face to face and gives Moses the 10 commandments. Gives Moses 10 commandments. And one thing that we have to understand about these commandments, okay, is this, that the 10 commandments were given not for the people to show God how good they were, but rather to show the people how good God was. That's what the law was for, by the way. That's what the law was for. See, see the law was to let every other nation know that Israel was a holy nation, a royal priesthood separated for his glory, which, which by the way, is another foreshadow of Christ. It's another foreshadowing of him. Jesus said this, I came to fulfill the law so that whosoever would be found in me would be blameless inside of the law. See, it was a representation of Christ, but it wasn't the fullness of Christ. Meaning, meaning simply this, the law was meant to show the people how good God was, just like Christ. But the difference between the two is the law had no power to cause you to live for God. Jesus came with the authority from heaven, with the power of God to cause God's people to live for God. That, that's the, and the law had no power to do that. The law was brought through Moses, but grace was brought through Jesus. Come on. How many of you are so grateful for the grace of God this morning? Are you thankful that it's by grace you are saved, not by work so that no man can boast? So that no man can boast. Moses is being used by, by God in mighty, mighty ways. And he shows great faith in multiple different ways throughout this, this scene. This story is, is littered with different scenes of Moses hearing from God and then doing exactly what God told him to do. Moses, I want you to do this. Moses, I want you to do that. And Moses does it. Time in and time again. But it's interesting because here in Deuteronomy chapter 34, in our main text of the day, we find Moses on the edge of his promise. He's, he's on the edge. Touch your neighbor again and say, get off the edge. Tell him, say, get off the edge. 
Moses at the end of his life finds himself on the edge of his promise. And he had done all these great things. All these amazing things he did through God. But yet God says to him, you will not receive it. You'll only see it with your eyes, but you won't enter into it. Even though you've done all this stuff, Moses, and even though at multiple seasons in your life you were obedient to me, you still are going to remain on the edge. Even though there's not going to be another prophet that will arise like you that will meet me face to face. There's no one going to do the things you've done except for you. Even though all of that, even because all that, you, you still are going to remain on the edge. It's like, what? What are you... What is happening here? In Numbers chapter 20, it it tells us and explains to us why Moses remains on the edge of his promise, not getting to walk in his promise. See, in in Numbers chapter 20, the, the people of Israel are thirsty again. And they're asking Moses to provide water for them again, just like he did the time before. But this time, it's not the rocket at Horeb. It's the rocket at Meribah. And, and this was a, a different rock. This was a different time. This was a different season. But because of Moses and his own frustrations, in his own impatience, believing in his own abilities to bring water from a rock, says in Numbers chapter 20, verse 10, he, he says this, Here now, you rebels. That's what he says. Talking to the people of Israel. Hear now, you rebels. Shall we, talking about himself and Aaron, shall we bring water from this rock? And Moses lifts his hand and he smacks the rock twice with the staff. And the water comes out in abundance. And they all drank, the whole congregation and their livestock. They all drank. And the Lord says this to Moses. He says, because you did not believe in me to uphold me as holy in the eyes of the people of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this assembly into the promise that I have given them. You will remain on the edge. See, Moses got to a point in his life where he thought it was because of who he was. God was moving in his life. That God did all these great things through him because of, because of him. He thought it didn't matter if he obeyed God exactly in this season. Because he thought his past obedience would be sufficient for his present circumstance. Past obedience doesn't buy us future obedience. It just doesn't. So instead of talking to the rock like God told him to do, he struck the rock. He struck it. Now we find him in Deuteronomy chapter 34, where he's dying. He's at the edge of his life. He's at the end of his life. He's on the edge of his promise. And he's not going to get to walk in it. Because see, God was was saying to him, behold, I'm, I'm trying to do a new thing. I'm trying to to do a new thing. How I did it before is not going to be how I did it again. But because Moses was so focused on how God did it before, he missed how God was trying to move now. He missed it. And you know, this is what I find to to be so true, that the biggest hindrance to the, the new move of God is the old move of God. That's the biggest hindrance. So many times we look for God to move the way he used to move. We study old revivals, right? We, we, we study Azuzu Street and we, we study Brownsville and we, and we study, study the Toronto blessings. And, and we're saying, God, I want you to move like that again. And those were incredible moves of God. But God says, behold, I'm doing a new thing. I'm going to do it different. I'm going to do it again. But if you're busy looking for me in the old ways, you'll never see me move in the new way, you'll, you'll miss it. You'll strike the rock instead of talking to the rock because you'll, you'll, you'll lack obedience in your current circumstance. You may get to see it with your eyes, but you'll miss it with your heart because you were too busy 
looking at how I did it, did it before. You were, you were too busy. busy. Church, we, we have to be very mindful not to be paying attention how God did it before. Expecting him to, to move that way again. Boxing him in and keeping men in a, in a nice picture frame. No, no. God wants us to rely on him brand new every day because he has fresh manna for us every single day. Just like he told the Israelites, don't store up manna. Don't, don't stir it up. Don't, don't store it up and hold it because it'll become rotten. It's the same thing with the move of God. He wants to bring a rhema word. But see, Moses, he was so busy paying attention to, to what happened before. He was trying to copy and paste, but we don't serve a copy and paste God. He's the God of the living, not the dead. He's the God of the, of the new. Behold, old things have passed away and all things are made brand new. Moses, because he focused on how God did it before, he missed how God was trying to do it again. And another reason that Moses missed it, another reason that he missed it is because he was thinking it was about him. Too often, I think we think that the reason why God is moving is because I'm here. The reason God is moving here is because of my prayers, because of my faithfulness. So that's why God is moving because, because I'm here. Listen, God wants our prayers and he honors our prayers and, and he loves when we pray. But the reason that God is moving is because he desires to move. It's just that simple. I tell our team all the time, listen to me, remain humble so that God remains moving. Because here's, here's the fact of the matter. Either God's going to move with us or he's going to move in spite of us. That's just, that's the reality. He's going to keep moving. You know why? Because he desires to move on his people. See, God was going to deliver the Israelites from Egypt, whether Moses was there or not. He was going to feed the people of Israel, whether Moses was there or not. He was going to provide water for them from the rock, whether Moses did what he did or not. He was going to do that because he provides all of our needs according to his riches and glory. He was going to do these things, whether Moses or not. The move of God is so heartedly and solely because of God. It's because of God. So the only question that, that remains is this. Are we going to be a part of what God is doing or is God going to keep moving in spite of us? That's our only question. It's the only question. And I don't know about any of you, I wanna remain humble so that God keeps moving and I keep being a part of what God is doing because God's gonna, gonna move. And the final thing, the very last thing that God pointed out to me in this was this, that he still provided water from the rock even though Moses was disobedient. Now, now think about that for a moment because this is what it's telling us. God's moving. God's moving is not evidence of us walking in obedience. It's not. It's not evidence that we're walking in obedience or we're going to walk in the promise because God moved. God desires to move. Even in our, our disobedience, God moves. God moved. Matthew chapter 7, we find Jesus and he paints this picture of the judgment day. He paints us this picture. And he says, on that day, there will be many, a bunch, many people who will say to me, Lord, Lord, didn't I prophesy in your name? Lord, Lord, didn't I, didn't I cast demons out in your name? Lord, didn't I, didn't I heal people in your name? Didn't I grow a big ministry and, and have a ministry in your name? Didn't I do all these great things, Jesus, in your name? But Jesus looks at him. It says, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you. I never knew you. Showing us that just because we see results from God doesn't mean we are walking in obedience with God. Because the name of Jesus holds weight above every other name, no matter what's happening in your life. It doesn't matter. Jesus is still on the throne all the time to the end of time. He just is. And, and this is the thing that, that has to be 
more than just lip service and words that we speak. Our walk with Jesus is going to require a real relationship with Jesus. It's going to require that. If we desire to to get off the edge and to walk into the promise of eternity, we're going to have to know him. We're not going to be able to point to the achievements we've done for him. It always blew my mind that as I'm reading this, on the final day, this is the final answer they get to give. Is this your final answer? Right? Like, is, is this your final answer? They point to achievements and not to relationship. It just blows my mind that, that I wouldn't be sitting there and Jesus says, why, why are you here in front of me? Because I love you because I've obeyed you, because I've worshiped you, because there's none like you in my life. Instead, point to the achievements that I've done in the presence of the one who has done it all. Our past obedience is not going to be able to cover our current circumstances. We have to have obedience at this time in life. We have to have it right now. And again, I'm not saying that we're not going to mess up. Listen, a righteous man falls seven times, but every time he gets right back up. This ain't about perfection. This is about following the one who's already been perfected, who's looking to perfect you. That's what this is about. We, We have to be obedient in the present circumstances that we find ourselves in. Moses points to all of his achievements. And there was no one like Moses. There there was not another, another man who would arise as a prophet like he was. None. That would meet God face to face. This is what the text tells us. But yet we find at the end of his life, even Moses couldn't point to his achievements to receive the promise. He just couldn't. He was not allowed to enter into the promise, to walk into the promises of God because he wasn't obedient to God in the season he was in. Come on, stand to your feet. And listen, I wonder how many of us are on the edge of our promise, but we're frustrated, we're impatient, we begin looking and focusing on what we've done so we think we are owed something more than than what we have we i wonder how many of us are on the edge of this this promise but we've been so focused on achievements that we've left behind our relationship with jesus trying to rely on past laurels to set us up in our current times I wonder, I wonder how many of us today would actually, if Jesus returned today, point to our achievements and not our relationship. I I just wonder, I wonder, but, but hear me for just a second, because you got to catch this, because this is the good news. All that stuff's challenging and it's tough and it's true. Jesus says this, count the cost. You want to come follow me, count the cost. You have to crucify yourself daily. Pick up your cross and follow me. That's the, that's the cost of following me. So there is a price to be paid. There is a cost to coming after Jesus. It's not all hugs and bubbles. It's not. This is a real life and a real battle against eternity, life, or death. That's what it is. But here's the good news. It doesn't matter where we currently are right now in life. It doesn't matter where we've been. It doesn't matter what we've done. It only matters that today we choose who we're going to serve. That today we say, you know what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see all that. And yeah, I'll mourn over that. But I'm excited about today because Jesus has set me free. He's called me a son and not a slave. He's called me a daughter and not a slave. I'm I'm a child of the most high God. What love has the father lavished upon us that we should be called children of God? This is the good news. That the only thing Jesus requires from our end is a turning to him. That's it. Father, forgive me. Jesus, I need you. It's that simple. It's that simple. And we've 
taking another step in obedience to him. And with every head bowed, every eye closed. Before we, we close this service, I, I want to I want to ask the most important question that anyone will ever ask you. Have you given your life over to Christ? Have you given your your life to Jesus? Have you received the promise of of eternal life? Because you don't have to remain on the edge of the promise if you give your life to Jesus. And so today, if you're here and you've never given your life to Christ, I'm just going to ask you really quickly, shoot up your hand so we can pray with you. Hallelujah. We thank you, Jesus. Yeah, we thank you, Jesus. Come on, all of us repeat this prayer after me, please. Lord Jesus, I believe in my heart that God raised you from the dead. And I confess with my mouth that you are Lord. And Jesus, I receive you. Jesus, I want to live for you. Jesus, I give my all to you right now. (laughs) Come on. Scripture says this, that all the heavens rejoice when one have given their life to Jesus. And this is the power of, of God's word. Even with me up here, probably stumbling and bumbling over my words with vertigo, God still was drawing people to him. Amen. It's incredible. God loves us so much that he give his only begotten son so that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. This is the love of the Father. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for salvation. We, we thank you for grace and mercy today. And Lord, I pray as we take this communion that we would be reminded of how your body was broken for us, how your blood was shed for us. Lord, I I pray that we would be reminded of that in your goodness towards us. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.